Okay. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and on the behalf of the uh, Friends of the Amar Civil War Prison Camp, welcome to uh, History Under the Trees. Every, every month it seems to grow just a little bit more, so hopefully we'll be packing the lot here shortly. The obligatory housekeeping rules, if you need to get a hold of us and haven't found us, um, follow us on our Facebook page or at our website at elmireprisoncamp.com. We do ask that you take all your trash with you because, as you can see, we're a carry-in, carry-out operation. But we do have a garbage can in the building. So, If you feel the need, there is an edge head behind the building that you're welcome to use. might be a little warm, but uh, it's there. Okay, the other thing is we run on volunteers, so if you're interested and you think you might want to help out every once in a while, please leave your contact name and number with us, and we will get back to you because we do like our volunteers. Um, and now for the usual, please help us with money appeal. Um, before you leave, if you're interested, there are membership forms here. The money that we take in through memberships um, lets us keep programs like this free and open to the public, allows us to keep our admission free, allows us to do the school programs that we do, and now that we have our library facilities, we're also looking to collect letters and diaries and um, in information directly related to Elmira. So, and that stuff, when you start looking at eBay, some of it's kind of pricey. Um, we also have on sale tonight uh, our baseball caps. You got one? They're usually $20. Uh, this month they're on sale for 15 through the end of the month. Ticket for the wrap. Yeah, that's the next on my list here. Oh. And this lovely lady behind the table here, our Vanna White. She's with uh, <laughs> Blue Irish Quilting, and she donated the uh, quilt for our raffle this year. Tickets are five dollars each, three for ten. And of course, cash donations are always welcome. And you said you got ice cold, cold water. Help yourself in yep. that container. And then just you know, you. drop something in the in the bucket when you take it. Our next program will be August 15th at 6 p.m. So with that, let's get to the meat of stuff. Wait a minute. That's when the quilt raffle drawing will Yes, be. and the raffle drawing will also be at our August history. Um, all right, so how exactly did a prisoner of war, or more accurately, 17 of them, manage to evade camp security? It's a prison, right? Problem. Nobody should get out. Well, we had a total of 17. We had two the, uh, the month the camp opened. There were 11 in October, one in November, two in December, one in March that tried but didn't quite make it, and then another one in April of 65. Uh, almost kind of a worth, you know, he was going home a month later anyway. <laughs> Out of all the uh, prisons in the, in the north, there were officially 1,273 total prisoner escapes. The single largest came out of Camp Douglas out in Illinois. Uh, 153 got out of that one. The one at the top of the list with the least amount is Johnson's Island. Well, that's easy. They had a total of nine. You know why? Johnson's Island's in the middle of Lake Erie. Okay. <laughs> Not many people jump into the lake and swim out. <laughs> so, if you take out Johnson's Island, which was a natural fortress, um, we were at the at the top with the least number of escapes. So, July sixth, eighteen sixty four, tr boxcar trains show up down at the main Erie station, right down there by McDonald's. Four hundred Confederate prisoners of war get off the train. July 7th, two of them leave. <laughs> they decided that they were going to scale the walls of the prison. Now the wall was a 12-foot stockade wall, smooth-sided on the inside, the guards were on the outside. Well, how in God's green earth did two guys manage to get up a bare wall with nothing else around them? Keep in mind, when those 400 showed up, Uncle Sam and his wonderful wisdom had failed to account 
for having a guard here. So when those troops showed up, there were no guards assigned to Elmira. The camp commandant was forced, at that time he was a draft rendezvous, he was forced to run around town collecting up the sick, the lame, the lazy, the guys who were at the hospital that were recuperating, guys that were home on leave, guys that were here recruiting to fill up units in the field, draftees, substitutes, you name it. If you were here and you were wearing a uniform, you were pressed into service. None of them had experience. Draftees probably didn't care at that point. So, and nobody knew how to run a prison here. So it's pretty understanding how they got out. Um, four days later, they found one of them down along the river. They brought him back and asked around the camp, anybody know this dude? No, 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 never saw him before, don't know who he is. It was his clothing that kind of sort of gave him away. He still had his uniform on. <laughs> so it was a little difficult to explain why he was hanging out by the river. His buddy that went with him, nobody ever knows what happened to him. And at this point, we don't know the names of either one of those individuals. So they're still kind of in the history books as shadows. Then again, on August 1st, starts the saga of Sergeant Joseph Womack. Now, Sergeant Womack was a member of Wade Hampton's legion, cavalry le legion, and he was captured down in Virginia. And he was captured, he was sent to Point Lookout down in Maryland, and Point Lookout had a really bad reputation because it's, if you've ever been down there, it's just, just this spit of sand out that sticks out to the uh, Chesapeake Bay. He was one of the first transfers here to Elmira. When he walks in, he befriends a guy by the name of Barry Benson. Barry Benson was a sharpshooter. And if you look him up online, you'll find that he's got a nice little uh, autobiography written of his, his exploits. Now, Barry was a good guy to know. Why? Because he'd been captured two other times, escaped twice before he got to Elmira. So it's like, hey, this dude might know what he's doing. So they get together and they decide that they were going to form a pact. Well, once they did that, what did they do? These guys were pretty dis disciplined about what they did. First thing they did, they decided to walk the entire camp and look for weak points. Then they sat down and considered the merits of different ways to go. The first was to collect up all the other inmates and do a mass charge on the guards to get out. Eh, they decided <laughs> eh, the, the chances of that working aren't, aren't so good especially if they found out there was artillery out here. So they said, nah. Second thing they did is says, well, we could be a little bit more sneaky and we can overpower the guards that are on the inside. Take their clothes and when they come in to do the change of guard, we can go out with the guard mount. And you say to yourself, how did they expect to get away with that? Because the other guards would know that they weren't, weren't real guards. Keep in mind, we still had a bunch of uh, inexperienced people, and about that time is when they started getting militia units in. So people were coming and going, new faces everywhere, nobody knew anybody. So that, that stood a chance of working. But after thinking about it and talking about it, they said, what we're going to do is we're going to tunnel, and we're going to dig. So now they go looking around all over this place. Now, if you know anything about the confines of the camp, a lot of people think just in terms of this small area. Go from the intersection here, all the way down past Foster Ave, down towards, what did we say it was, 511? Or 811? Well, down by Gwinnett. Yeah, down by Gwinnett. That was the east end of the camp and went all the way to the river. It's a pretty big place. At the far end, at the west end, is where they built the hospitals. Now, you see how this barracks building is built up off the ground? If you look at it, you'll see one end looks higher than the other. They found a hospital building that did just that. They found one that sat so that as they walked up to the front of it, when the guard's back was turned, they could drop and roll underneath and crawl to the back all the way to the far end, and they could dig in the middle and not be seen because the building was down low enough unless you were all the way down. Again, guards being inexperienced, they didn't know what to look for, and they weren't looking, so they started to dig. What did they use to dig with? They went for top shelf tools. 
They went to the cookhouse and stole a couple of table knives. <laughs> and that's what they started to dig with, believe it or not. They dug at night, so what they would do is they'd roll up under not at night, get in there and start digging away, and in the morning they'd disappear again. They decided that they needed to lay in supplies for their, for their escape, too. So they go to the cook, to the uh, commissary building inside, steal several boxes of hard bread, which most people know as hardtack, and a bushel of beans. Well, that almost proved to be their undoing, because the next morning, uh, cook sergeants go in, all their stuff is gone. Well, that created an uproar in the camp. Guards pulled everybody out. It was from, you know that movie, uh, Fugitive? I want a hard target search of every hen house, dog house, bunk, barracks. I don't care if there's a rat hole, you tear it apart. And they sat in their tent all day sweating about getting found out. The guards never looked under buildings. So, again, they got away with it. All their stuff was secreted in the tunnel, so they kept it. Well, this goes along for a couple of weeks. Just about ready to finish it up. They crawl in the last night or so beforehand. It's caved in. What in God's green earth has happened to my tunnel? They're looking around, looking around, so they decided just to sit and hang out and see what happened. Well, a little bit later, a couple more guys showed up, rolled underneath, and did the exact same thing. Had a different crew of, that was digging in there that knew nothing about these two, huh. and their tunnel ran into the other tunnel and collapsed the first one. Oh. So Benson and, and, and this, the, the other gentleman there, they decide that, well, <coughs> let's just all get together, decide <laughs> on one tunnel, and we'll all do it. Well, that went along pretty good. They were all set to, they was the night before they were ready to break out, and when Womack and Benson shows up, there's twice the number of people that are normally there to dig. Friends that invited friends. Well, uh, Benson and, Trump and Womack look at it and say, this is not good. The more people that are here, the higher the risk. So they turn around and go back to their tent. Well, the next morning, bright and early, the guards go rushing to the to the end and they're all standing around where the hole was supposed to come out and when those guys came up out of the hole they caught them. There's a reason that they got caught and we'll talk about that a little later. So in the meantime Sergeant Womack as an orderly sergeant and a ward sergeant it gets, starts to get familiar with the officers and he makes some friends and they apparently got to talking and the officer found out that Womack liked, liked to read. So he starts giving them books to read. Innocent, right? Well, one day Sergeant Womack gets a book. Lo and behold, in the middle is a blank, unsigned camp pass. Nothing on it, totally blank, authorization to walk out the front gate. Can't believe his, his good luck. He very cl he closes up the book, goes finds his friend Barry, shows him the uh, pass. Mr. Benson says, I know exactly who you need to go talk to. You need to go talk to a guy by the name of Miller. Come to find out, Miller was an engraver before the war. And he had started a business in the prison of forging orders on the Camp Sutler. <laughs> he was forging Major Colt's signature on it and getting extra supplies and extra food and whatever. And he'd been apparently pretty successful. Well, Womack thinks about this, and he thinks about it, he thinks about it, he says, you know, I don't trust somebody else to know what I've got, and I'm not so sure I want to go this route. So he puts the pass back in the book and gives the book back to the officer. Well, this goes along, all transpires between August 1st and October 7th. On October 7th, the morning of, is the great tunnel escape. At this point, a tunnel gets up outside the barracks and 10 guys get out. Well, how did that happen? Well, initially it was thought that only seven got out. But part of that was because the ward sergeants that were responsible for reporting war roll call, they agreed not to report missing men that morning. So roll call was held all present and accounted for. The Federal Guards never double-checked. For two, three days, they never double-checked. 
Finally, they did another roll call, and oops, oh, by the way, there's three more guys that are missing. So, but by then, they blocked off the tunnel because they found it. It was estimated that the tunnel took about, the tunnel that they got out took about five weeks. Okay? Five weeks. Five weeks. It's a long time digging with knives. So, let's see, where are we at? Yeah, yep, that's 10. At the time Holmes was writing the book, he was trying to find all these guys. By that time, three of the guys that were involved in this, one of them, the mastermind, uh, had passed away, and a couple others had disappeared, and, a, and another guy disappeared with no trace. Nobody ever knows what happened to the guy. So most of what is known came from an article in the Montgomery, Alabama Advertiser. When did this article get printed? 1902. Okay. <laughs> this whole story never hit the papers until 1902, except for right here in Elmira. Think about how fast news spreads today. But on top of that, that account was a secondhand account by a lady who had transcribed and read uh, Sergeant Strug Scruggs, the sixth sergeant's original, di uh, original account of it that was not written until 1887, quite a few years after the war. 1887, 1886, somewhere in there, is about the time Reconstruction was moving out of the South and the Southern states were starting to take over. So a lot of these stories started to float to the top because up until then, that wasn't something that you uh, owned up to. So who were these other guys? And by the way, the name of the title of the article was a th The Thrilling Story of Ten Intrepid Confederates Who Escaped from the Horrors of the Military Prison in Elmira. Now mind you, these guys, October 7th, came in on July 6th, some of them. They weren't here that long. And they were here when, before rations were cut, they were here before things really got truly overcrowded. So they had some pretty good, uh, pretty good days here. They originally came, who were they? They originally came from Jeff Davis Artillery, Carter's Battalion. One of the guys that helped start the tunnel enlisted in Selma, Alabama in June of 1861. And everybody today knows what happened in 1961, 66, 67 in Selma. So... Not me. Huh? Not me. Selma? Civil Rights Marches. I'm from the South. Ah, okay. Whereabouts? I mean, uh, North South Okay. Charleston. Charleston. Okay. That's where everything started. Yeah, that's where it started. That's where, that, that's where this all, the whole mess started. Well, one of the guys involved, uh, J.P. Mall, uh, J.P. Fox, or John Fox Mall, he claims to have been the guy that fired the signal cannon that started the Battle of the Seven Days Fight in 1862, right? Seven days, yeah. 62. I'm not the battle expert, he is. So, he claims to have been the one to pull the, the lanyard that started that battle, which was a pretty nasty engagement down on the peninsula. He was also captured at the Wilderness May 12th, along with Barry Benson and a whole bunch of other guys, at a place called the Mule Shoe. If anybody uh, knows where it is, that was a pretty nasty place to be fighting. And several of the units that broke through and took many of the prisoners came out of the Elmira area. The 86 New York specifically, they were a, a unit from Steuben County, but one of the companies was recruited predominantly here in Elmira and uh, uh, Wells Corner. Wellsville. Well, uh, Millerton area, Jackson Corner, Jacksonville at that time. That was all company D. Yep. Well, first place they go is Point Lookout. That's where they meet this gentleman, and then they get transferred to Elmira. They meet a gentleman by the name of Frank Sorry. Well, all these guys ended up in the 110. It's listed as being the second tent on the west end of the second row of tents nearest the city. And what that means is, is up towards Water Street, up 
up in that area over there, there were rows of tents that went across. And they were double rowed back to back. Originally, their tent was in that second row, facing away from the street and away from the wall at the far end of the row of tents, as opposed to being on the east end. The front row of tents was only 35 feet from the wall. Elmira is one of the few, is one of the only ones that we know that did not have what they called a deadline. And a deadline was basically just distance from the wall that uh, prisoners weren't allowed to touch or go, go into because if they did, there was no questions asked. You stepped into the area, they shot at you. Period. End of story. Didn't happen here in Elmira. They didn't. They put the tents 35 feet from the wall. You could do whatever you wanted to do. Well, there were a couple guys in the tent by the name of Higgins, Pudinat, Alfred, and Cobb. And Maul decides he's going to talk to these guys. And three out of the four object to this tunnel plan. They said, no, we don't want anything to do with it. He says, well, we can't dig in the tent if somebody doesn't. <laughs> so the one guy that says, yeah, OK, I'll help you, How, they found an empty tent closer this way. Actually, it worked out in their favor. But how to convince the guards that there was a reason for them to leave that tent to come down to here? Well, they staged a fight. And the gentleman that uh, decided that that's what he was going to use, Mr. Maul, uh, his account says that he came out of that one pretty well bruised up. So I'm not so sure that it was staged as much as it was some latent hostility there. But anyway, they moved down here. Same second row in facing away from the wall, but it ended up being only the third one from the east end, so it was closer to this end. Then they decided that, well, maybe they should bring out another digger that would go faster. They made a pact. They said, anybody in this group, if you start digging with us and you spill the beans, one of us is going to come for you with a knife. So don't spill the beans literally. And anybody who discovered them, they decided, anybody who discovered that what they were up to had two choices. You could join the crew and not spill the beans or get knifed, or not join the crew and get knifed. <laughs> so there really wasn't much of a choice for those guys. They didn't have much of a problem with that. So they decided they're going to go up in equipment and they steal a spade from a contractor that's digging ditches in the company streets. Now a spade, so they stole a spade. Now a spade we think of today as a hoe. Well, it wasn't a hoe. It was a, a straight shovel. And they figured, well, we'll just dig real fast with this. Problem, when they got down in there, anybody ever seen what ground around here looks like beneath the surface? What's it full of? Rocks. So when you throw an iron shovel against a rock, a lot of noise. So they decided that, well, they, could, they ditched the spade and they went back to the knives. Now, exactly how they go about it? Engineers, I swear to God, they were engineers. They cut a round hole, they removed the sod very carefully, set it aside, and they went down four feet. While they were doing that, they kept the tent flaps closed so nobody could see what was going on in there and the rest of the guys hung out in front. Then they stole some planks from the walkway of the hospitals at the other end of the camp. Steal the stuff as far away from you as you can so that uh, it's, you're not stealing on your own turf. What they would do is they'd put the planks over the hole at night and cover, the, put the side back in so it didn't look like there was a hole there. One of the guys had an extra shirt so they cut it up and made smaller bags out of it. Hell about a pint of dirt. They had a coat that had a cape on it with a lining they cut a slit into. And what they would do is they'd take these three, four, five, six bags of dirt, slide them into the uh, lining, the guy put the coat on, walk around camp, and wherever he went, he'd look around, take one of the bags out, pour the dirt on the ground. But that only happened after they dug the first night. First night they took and spread it on the street. They said, we don't have to go very far. They're doing this after dark. They get up the next morning for roll call, Horror of horrors. They look at what they did overnight. 
the dirt coming out of the tunnel was an entirely different color than the dirt in the streets. And they thought for sure that that was going to show people that somebody was digging. But apparently, inexperienced guards never caught on. So they got lucky again. All right. Now, to move that dirt, this was a project. Because you're in the hole, and the hole is only big enough for one guy. I mean, we're not talking about turning around and passing buckets. <laughs> so what they would do is the guy in front would sit, would lay on his side and dig and push the dirt back towards his knees and keep pushing. And then there was another guy in the hole behind him that would collect it, pull it back to the hole, fill the bags, hand it up to the guy, and that's the way they got the dirt out. Well, that took a little bit longer, and it started to wear on him because it was hard work. You get down in those holes, and you can't breathe because there's no air circulation. The air gets stale, you get headaches, you get sick. So rather than uh, stress themselves, they go and recruit another guy by the name of Cree Crops Malone. Now, Cree Crops was an Alabama guy. And just after they recruited him, they got maybe a little suspicious because there was an unexpected call for inspection. Everybody's tents had to be inspected. Two guys are down in the hole digging because these guys decided to start digging during the day. So there's two guys in the tunnel. So they hurry up, put the boards over the top, put the sod down, take their tent down, go through inspection, make it through, don't get caught. But in the meantime, these two dudes are laying in the tunnel. No light, no air, no nothing. They got away with it. Um, because things started to wear on them, they needed a little bit of extra food. So they decide, after this inspection incident, they needed help from some of the administration within the camp. So they recruited another orderly sergeant who would know when the guards were coming so that he could alert them or tell them when there was an inspection planned. Well, this enterprising sergeant that they recruited to be the early warning said, I got an even better idea for you. Why don't we recruit the sick sergeant? And what happened is, is there was a, a sergeant within the barracks identified to take to be the liaison between the hospital and the barracks for guys that were sick. But that guy, the sick sergeant, had the ability to request extra food for the persons who were on the sick roll. So he would come in, go through, certify this guy is being sick, that guy is being sick, and that resulted in two extra buckets of soup for these five or six guys and extra fresh bread. So they were getting extra rations ahead of everybody else. Well, that guy's name was Scruggs. Then they decided it wasn't going fast enough. Remember the story about as few people as possible? They've recruited five or six now. They recruit three more diggers. So now you got three more people running around. One of the first guys, all of a sudden, doesn't start, he doesn't show up for his shifts. He just shirks. He doesn't, doesn't show up, doesn't come, doesn't dig as much as he used to. So the ringleader goes looking for him, find out what's up. He thought maybe the guy was working as an informant and they were about to get busted. Now, the guy was an opportunist. He had found out about another tunnel and he was spending time between the two of them waiting to see which one was going to be finished first because whichever one was done, that's the one he was going to go out in. So that's what happened with him. Come to find out, two other guys on this digging squad for the tunnel escape were also digging on another tunnel probably why they were breaking down so fast. They weren't just digging their own, they were digging another one too. Well, in the process of that, one of the diggers for this tunnel was approached by Mr. Benson, the guy we talked about before. He walks up to the guy guarding the tent door and he says, you know boys, you guys need to be a little bit more careful because I know what you're doing. You're digging. And if I know you're digging, other people know you're digging. And I want in, and if you don't let me in, a whole lot of other people are going to know you're digging. So they take on Mr. Benson. He decides that he's going to help him out, and he does a pretty good job because he figures out how to move the dirt out faster. He finds himself a box, attaches a couple cords so they could pull, fill the box and pull the box back and forth. 
So emptying it became a little bit easier for themselves. Shortly after that, Mr. Trowig, one of the guys they recruited that was digging another tunnel, got called to the Commandant's office. Oh boy, pucker factor goes up. Let's see what happens. Trowick gets tossed in the guardhouse because they found the tunnel that he'd been digging under the hospitals, and there was a piece of paper in there with his name. If you're going to break out, don't take anything with identification with you. Just don't do it. It's a bad idea. So he ends up in the guardhouse. Now, the guardhouse is basically the equivalent of a military hospital, or jail. I'm sorry, not hospital. We've got hospital in the brain. While he's there, he meets a guy by the name of Crawford. Crawford, lo and behold, is in jail because he'd been digging a tunnel. He says, well, I got news for you. I'm working on another tunnel that hasn't been found, so how about you join us, and when we get out of here, we'll go with that tunnel. Well, in order to do that, they send word out to the tunnel team, said, hey, get us a file, and we'll figure out how to get out of here, and when the time comes, you let us know, and we'll get out of here and join you. So Mr. Maul says, okay. So he goes out, and he's wandering around camp, goes and finds the guys that are making rings. And if you know anything about the camp, there was a small trade that showed up where the uh, prisoners created carved art and rings and little baubles and beads and stuff. Well, they, they used files to do that. So he comes back from the ring makers with a file. How did they get it into them? They didn't have a cake, but they had loaves of bread. So the file goes in the loaf of bread. He goes through, word comes back, I got the bars done, I'm ready to go anytime you are. Well, tunnel's nearly complete, they choose their partners, they set up their uh, decision to go. First, first guy goes out, they punch the hole. First guy goes out and he goes across the street, gets, gets out of sight. The second guy watches until he gets out of sight and is safe. Number two goes back through the tunnel, after crawling to get to the hole, goes back through the tunnel and gets number three guy. They crawl forward, number two goes up out of the hole. When he's out and gone, number three goes back and gets number four. That was the plan. Uh, problem was, number three fell asleep. <laughs> he, he wasn't feeling well, he'd had a headache, probably induced by digging. Fell asleep and the cool air coming from the open end of the tunnel, coming through, woke him up. So he says, oh my God, what's going to happen? So he looks around, looks around, looks around, sticks his head up out. Right across the street is a, a fire with six guards standing around it. And while he's looking at these guys, right overhead, he hears, four o'clock and all is well. His heart goes through his, you know, comes out of his chest. He says, oh my God, I'm six feet away from this guy. He's going to see me. So rather than go all the way back because it was already 4 a.m., it was getting light, he decides to go up and out. Well, guys are right across the street. He says, boldness, that's what I'm going to do. He comes up out, crawls out, stands up, and walks directly towards those guys. And as he hits Water Street, he takes a right like he's going towards town. Nobody challenged him. Nobody said anything. So he's walking down Water Street, heading for town, so he can find some tr uh, buildings to get around to get to this barn that they had agreed to go to, that they could see from the camp. As he's walking, he sees three soldiers coming towards him. He's like, crap, what am I going to do now? So he hurries up, jumps through a side yard, runs through a side gate, through a potato patch, and ends up meeting a couple, three guys. Well, by then, it's almost daylight. So they decide their best chance, they decide to go further west, crossed at the far end of the camp, and went across the river. And that all happens the night of the 6th into the morning of the 7th. They get up on the side hill over here in Mount Zor. Wherever they were, they could see what was going on down here in the camp. And they write about seeing all, everybody clustered around their tent and seeing all the hubbub around it. And they laid there all day. Later on that night, they struck out and headed south. And one of the accounts that we found um, indicates that the guy got, they got as far as the mile marker post five south of the city where the railroad meets the road meets the turnpike. You got to thinking about it. We're not quite sure where that is, but five miles from here out, pretty close to Bulkhead area, 
out where 328 and 14 come together. And just beyond that, the old uh, railroad used to cross the road right there. So we're thinking maybe that's where they ended up. Because later on, his account talks about going down along the railroad, which skirted a creek. They would go off into the woods. Then they talk about getting into uh, uh, Waverly, or not Waverly, Troy and Williamsport. So that all happens through October 7th. One of the groves that he walked through up here, and I don't know where this is yet because I haven't looked, it's old number 11 school. There was a grove uh, right there that had soldiers in it that they went by as they went out and over. So we'll be able to eventually trace which way they went. All right. And they went a whole bunch of things, ran into a whole bunch of people, skirted. Now, back to Mr. Mr. Womack. The morning of the 7th, he hears about this tunnel escape. And he and Barry Benson have been working together on this other tunnel. So he goes to find Barry. Barry's nowhere to be found. Barry went with them the night before and didn't come get him. So he's a little bit, a little bit disturbed that he wasn't told. So he says, all right, I'm going to have to figure my own way out. What's he do? He goes back to the same officer that loaned him the book several weeks earlier gets the book. He says, I didn't dare open the book until I got all the way back to my tent. He wanted to see if the pass was still in there. Lo and behold, he gets back, he opens up the book, the pass is still there. He says, this is my way out, but I'm not going to have anybody else do it. I'm going to figure out how to do it. So he spends several weeks practicing Major Colt's signature, tries a couple fake orders on the sutler, gets away with it, figures it's good enough, so he fills it out. Now this is late October. They're transitioning from the militia out of New York City and Rochester that were here working as temporary guards because Uncle Sam hadn't assigned anybody, and the veteran reserve corps that were the, the active soldiers that were reassigned here to take their place. Transition time. Nobody knew anybody again. So he picks out a name of an officer that he figures nobody would know, puts it on there, walks up to the gate, hands the, and it's cold. So he's wearing an overcoat, he's got the collar pulled up, he'd stolen an officer's coat from one of the offices, pulls his hat down low, walks up, hands the pass to the guard at the gate, the guard looks at it, opens the gate, escorts him to the outer guard, outer guard looks at it, hands it off to the lieutenant, and he's standing there waiting, and waiting, and he's waiting for, you know, he's waiting for the lightning bolt to hit him, right? <laughs> And then he hears the lieutenant say, it's okay, Sergeant, he can pass. So he starts out the gate, and he's past the outer limit of the guard, and he's ready to start walking down the street. And it's like, oh, crap, I didn't get the pass. So he backs up, turns around, goes back to see the guard to get the pass. Because if he left without it, there would have been a, he, he would have been in trouble if anybody found him without the pass. So he goes back so that he doesn't have somebody running around trying to find him to give him the pass. And he figures because he was bold enough to walk back and ask for it, it was one of the reasons they didn't question him. He gets the pass, walks back out, down Water Street, into an alley, dumps his uh, uniform clothing. He's managed to collect civilian clothing and comes out a civilian. And he goes south. Only this guy ends up going out down through Waverly. And while he's down there, he gets down to the train station in town, train station in town, it's four hours late. He says, I can't hang around here. This is, this is nonsense. So Womack decides, I'm just going to walk down the train tracks. Well, that took him down through Waverly. He gets to the train station in Waverly about daybreak. The station master's just getting up and getting things started. He says, ah, go over to the tavern, get yourself something to eat. The train will be through shortly. So he goes over. He sits down. He sees a tavern owner looking at him kind of fish-eyed. Oh man, he recognized me. He knows I'm a I'm an escape prisoner. And he's going to say something. Pretty soon, Tavern Omer comes over to him and says, "Don't worry about it. I'm a Democrat. I won't. Nobody will hurt hurt you while you're here." More people started to come in. The more people are looking at him and talking to him, and he's like, "Oh man, this is not a good thing." Turns out he got a hold of the tavern keeper and says, "Man, I got to get out of here. There's too many people looking at me weird." He says. Don't worry about it. We're all Democrats here. Nobody is going to hurt you while you're in my building. 
they gave them money, they gave them food, they gave them extra clothes, put them on the uh, train, south. He ends up getting into New York City. He spends some time with a lady who's married to a guy he knew in Charleston at one point in time. He decides to become a tourist in New York City. So he's out looking at the fords, looking at the sites. Decides he's going to take the ferry out to Fort Hamilton. So he gets up on the dock at Fort Hamilton, all set to go out and play tourist, and he runs into an officer he knew from Elmira, of all places. Why? Because the 28th and 99th militia were out of New York City. And he ran into one of the militia officers down there. Fortunately, he says, I managed to leave before he saw me. And I figured my time as a tourist had come to an end. So he heads he head south. And that happened on October 26th. Let's see here. At the end of the war, he ends up working in Frankfort, Kentucky. He actually ends up writing a letter to a guy by the name of Melvin Conklin. Now, Melvin Conklin was a member of the 151st New York. He was here on recruiting duty. He got scarfed up in that thou shalt come and do whatever the Army tells you to do business back in July. Well, they took Melvin, and Melvin became an inside the camp spy. And he would walk around looking for things. And uh, they became friends, but Conklin is the one that had discovered the other tunnels underneath the hospitals. Um, his first tunnel he found under Hospital One. They were the guys that were digging at night. He found it, he saw it, he knew what was going on, but his orders were to let them continue to dig and keep an eye on it to the point where they were ready to break out, let them know, so that they could put guards out where the tunnels come out. And that's exactly what happened. They didn't know this until after the war had started swapping. Womack comes back and visits. He comes back and visits Conklin here after the war. No problem. Conklin also found a second tunnel under hospital number two, the next one down. They said, well, you found this one. Let's move to the next building. The third tunnel that was found was at the lower end of the camp in the northeast corner. So it would have been at this, in this end somewhere. What they had done is they had built a chimney near the rear of the tent and tunneled down inside the chimney. It was directed north and outward and would have exited near what was called Ed Warner's Grocery Store near Hoffman Creek. Now that's another one we got to find. Find out where that building was because now we'll know where that tunnel was supposed to come out. Apparently there were two more that were found in tents on the flat near the fence next to the river. Two more in the barracks next to the east fence, halfway between Water Street and the pond. <laughs> this area right in here. After that, there were, no, there were no more attempts until sometime in November. In November of 64, one of the more colorful characters, by the name of Buttons, um, he gets away. And his was rather novel in that he went to the dead house, convinced some friends to put him in a box, not nail it down tight, put the box on the wagon, and he went out with the load of the dead for the day. He figures he gets out a little bit, he throws the lid off the top, and according to the account, he raised up, told the driver if he made an outcry, he would shoot him. I don't know where he would have gotten the firearm from, but anyway says the driver was so paralyzed with fear that he made no noise. I think he was probably more par paralyzed by fear of a dead guy coming to life. But anyway, Button said he ran across the field to the railroad and jumped into a trackman shanty for warmth because it is cold and there's snow on the ground. The trackman found him and sheltered him for two days, provided extra clothing and food. After that, they don't know how he got out of town, but after that, Conklin, <laughs> his boss told him, from here on out, you will be at the dead house every day. You will inspect to make sure that they are all dead, and you will ensure that all the lids are nailed tight. You will accompany the wagon to the gate and vouch for the load. Before, and he did that up until uh, mid-February when he was reassigned and sent back to his unit in the field. By the way, he... Conklin went out west to Nebraska after the war, but he came back to Elmira uh, and ended up being the postmaster here. He was also active in the Grand Army of the Republic, and he was the one that got the markers, the 
uh, two granite markers that marked the confines of the camp. He was the guy that got those uh, set back in uh, the 1800s. His son ended up going to West Point, served in the Philippines and made major before he got out. In December, there was a note that there were two escapes. There's no indication whether or not they were successful. There's no report of them. Nobody knows much of anything about it at this point. One of them, they do know something about. A guy, but little kid by the name of Benny Orkut. And for those of you who were here last month, you heard the story of Benny Orkut. Benny was a little, uh, little guy from South Carolina. He worked in one of the admin offices up front. And he watched everything coming and going. One of the officers' name was RRR Dumars. Three R's, not a laugh, RRR, Robert something something Dumars. Not long ago, we found his uh, sword, his officer's sword on the internet, bought it and brought it home. So we now own Mr. Dumars' sword. Historical Society has a picture of Mr. Dumars, Captain Dumars, with that sword in his hand. So it's kind of a cool thing to, to have here. Well, anyway, Dumars was using his son to do errands for him. And everybody got, you were supposed to show up, knock on the window, push a pass through the wicket. And it got to the point where, well, you know, Dumars, yeah, he's my captain, it's his son. All the kid did was yell his name, Dumars, as he came up, guarded open the gate, and Jimmy Dumars would go out the gate. Well, Benny Orchid's watching this did happen. He says, you know, I'm the same size, same size, shape, and build as Jimmy. Let me try this. So one day, he finds himself an old slouch hat, steals a coat out of one of the officer's offices, and towards the evening, when they're changing the guard, he decides he's going to try it. So he heads towards the gate, got it, his head down. He's trucking out the gate. He yells, Dumars. Door opens. Then he's out the door and never comes back. <laughs> so. After that, uh, Jimmy Dumars didn't work in the camp any longer. <laughs> uh, his father said, go find something else to do. In March of 16, uh, March 16th in 1864, a guy by the name of Dick Turpin was Colonel Moore's trustee, basically his servant. March 16th was during the flood. In March of 65, this whole area flooded with a, with a quick melt off of all the snow. So it flooded the camp and things were in a little bit of a disarray. And Mr. Turpin decided that now's my chance. So he gets up, walks out, goes up Water Street towards Gwinnett Bath. He's walking right past in front of the guard's artillery camp. The guard said, mm-mm, picked him up, walked him back. He never got out. And then in April 65, another unknown name. This is another novel approach. He was aided by the driver of the Swill Wagon. Now, <laughs> Swill, for those of you who don't know, is all the leftovers from meals. All this, the trash, ash trash, trimmings, really nasty collection of stuff. And they collected it in barrels the size of what they called hogsheads, which are those big wooden barrels that everybody cuts in half to make planters out of. That's what uh, the salt pork used to be shipped in. Every day, a wagon took three of those out from each kitchen. Somehow, some way, he convinced somebody to allow him to climb into that swill barrel and be transported out. Now, you can see, you'll see the side, the height of the wagon. You put the barrel on it. Unless somebody looks down from the guard walk, you don't see him. He gets out, climbs outside with just his nose sticking outside, and jumps out. And nothing more was ever heard from him either. So. With that, 30 days prior to the closing of the camp, the last guy manages to get out of town. So, with that, those are the stories of the 17 successful people and a couple unsuccessful folks in the process. So, one of the things we'll do is, as we go along, we'll hunt up some more information on each of these individuals, find out where they were born, you know, what they did after the war, as much as we can. So, I appreciate you. Thank you guys for coming. Anybody, anybody that wants to, yes. Did you say questions? Yes. Yes. Are any of those parts of those tunnels still? Probably not. 
um, because Not once you now. find it, you would have, as, as a guard, you would have blocked them up to prevent anybody else from using them again. Well, and the 72 flood might have taken the well, every, You figure from, that was 1864, 65, mm -hmm. this was all farmland. After the war, they sold it back to farms, so it's been farmed, it's yeah. been flooded, then the houses were built up here. Yeah. No. Most of that would be a, a real miracle. <laughs> the, the pieces of the tunnels are probably somewhere in the Chesapeake Bay at yeah. this point. <laughs> Maybe so. we should have a tunnel digging. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the the next living nice. history we have, that's what they get to do. <laughs> as long as we don't dig into one of the waterboard pipes. Mm. Uh, is Jerry Yeomans here? No? Did he pay for it or he was going to pay for it? He paid for it. I'll, I'll okay. get it from his All right. We got a hat for him. He was supposed to pick it up tonight. If you want to do any reading, there are several copies of the Elmira Prison Camp, if you haven't already read it, over at the Steele Memorial Library. You can also find it online for free. Um, several times I posted it uh, on our Facebook page, but what I'll do tomorrow is I'll post the link again for you folks if you want to read it uh, for free online. This copy is not an original. Um, I got it for 25 bucks on the internet, so they're available. Yeah. How thorough were their records of the Confederate soldiers that were coming in? I mean, did they have names and origin, where they're from? Yes. Yes. They did. What, what would happen was, when you were captured in the field, you were taken to a major holding area. Right. And usually that was just a big, big open field with a bunch of guards around it. At that point in time, they would take you and put you on a muster roll, break you up into manageable groups, so when they called your group, they could call roll call. From there, you got transported to a, a permanent prison. In the case of most of our first 3,000, they all came from Point Lookout. They were already in a prison. So when they left Point Lookout, there was a muster roll from Point Lookout given to the officer of the guard. The officer of guard, as soon as he signed that uh, muster roll, was responsible for those guys. Those guys were no longer a member of Point Lookout, nor were they a member of Elmira Prison yet. They were in Never Never Land. When they got up here, they went through what they called an intake procedure. And they went through and created the muster roll again, in triplicate, quadruplicate, whatever the government decides to do. They checked them for money, they checked them for valuables, and all that other stuff. And then they assigned them to a, what they called wards, which essentially were men grouped by 100 in barracks or in tent groups of 100. And the, every morning, they'd call the roll based on the list that they had. And the sergeants had to verify that they were there or not there. Yeah. Now, the records, are they, where are they kept, the records for this prison camp? Where, where the are original, they? The Smithsonian or? They're kind of all over the place. All over. Um, the original records, most of them, for the prison camp itself are at the National Archives in Washington, the original records. There are copies of microfilm at the Historical Society. Um, there are, are copies of records of the Elmira Depot itself at the National Regional Archives in New York City. But again, it's one of those things, none of them are digitized. So yeah, nothing's so. on the internet yet, so if you yeah. were a family, let's say from North Carolina, <laughs> wanting to research. It's a long drawn out process. On top of that, Confederate military records for the individuals, unlike the Union, which were kept consolidated and are in Washington, Confederate records are all by state. So you, you really have to know which unit you're, uh, the guy you're researching came from, whether it was Virginia, you know, Georgia, North Carolina, Louisiana, you name it. Uh, and you have to go to those states to find those records, if they exist. A lot of records were destroyed, a lot of records were burned, um, so, but this young lady here can tell you all about trying to spreadsheet names so that we can sort things and, and digitize it, and it's a long haul. All the um, 2,936 men buried at Woodlawn that died here are on paper lists, but I was able to get a computerized list from Woodlawn and I'm comparing it with the list that Terry has in that book there, the Clay Holmes book, yeah, yeah. Definitely. as well as, um, what's the other one I'm using? The, uh, the book in the, from the 1980s. Oh yeah, yeah. There, there's a couple of other lists I'm comparing it to. Finding misspelled names, 
uh, but at least I'm finding um, and, and adding to the company, the regiment, and the state to those names that, are, that I got from Woodlawn because they weren't on that list. Just the grave number and the name. And so, so that will be available. Um, I'm on the, what did I say? The, the S's. S's right now. <laughs> oh, so soon. Yeah. 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 And that's, that's only 3,000. There's only 9,700 and some odd oh. more to go. Oh, dear. But she's not volunteered to do those yet. No, I haven't. I'm not going to. I don't think she will. <laughs> don't live that long. Yeah. And that's just, that's just long, laborious, you know, looking at the screen, typing it in, looking at the screen, type. It just takes forever. But eventually our goal is to get it digitized so we can put it in a spreadsheet so it can be sorted and manipulated for data and, you know, find out how many of these guys actually survived, you know, whether they went out. Because there were a number of transfers out of here to Hospital South. So not everybody that didn't die left in June. Some left in October of 64, some in February of 65, some in March of 65. So, you know, we kind of like to know who went in which, which batches, so. But the most interesting I'm finding out, the largest number of deaths were from men from North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and part of that is because they comprise most of the prisoners here. They, they were the number one representation, uh, state representation. And most of that came from a place called Fort Fisher in Wilmington, North Carolina, or outside of Wilmington. Um, when Fort Fisher fell, 1,100, 1,400 of them, somewhere in that vicinity, were transferred here. They were brought here. So that's one of the reasons that they show up a lot. Not because anybody was hunting them down and killing them, as Tom Hanks would say in, what is it, Angels and Demons, when they were talking about hunting down the bad guys in the church. Oh, how do you say it? They hunt them down and kill them? No, that wasn't, that wasn't what we were doing. Is there a record of... Um who might be buried at the cemetery down by Weiss Markets? Because I assume there's some soldiers in there. Uh, that's Second Street Cemetery. That was a private cemetery. Yeah. What happened is right after the first 400 arrived, within a week, the government contracted for a half an acre burial ground up where the burying ground for the Confederates are now. Um, within two or three days, there were a couple of deaths, and they realized they needed, oh, we didn't plan for this either. so. They went and uh, leased some property up in Woodlawn, and that's where they went. Any other questions? Well, again, thank you for coming. Wow. Super story. Yeah. Um, stop and see our, our ladies over here. Take a take a whack at the quilt. See if yeah, that's a that's a beautiful quilt. The pattern is called Lincoln's Plank, right? Platform. Sorry. Lincoln's platform. Yeah. Lincoln's platform. Yes. Anybody that wants to after stay around, you up for a tour? I'll take you. Either one? I'll okay. tell you right now, it's hot in there. <laughs> yep. We'll go. Quick tour. Quick tour. Yeah. Oh, thank Just you. tell them, make sure you tell them it's quick. Yeah, yeah because it goes on and on and on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you end up telling stories and then you tell another well, story and another it. story. So. Thank you all for coming. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. And I uh, look forward to seeing you all again in August. So. Well, if you want to wander through the buildings a little bit. Yep. Oh. Hey, we need to get together sometime. Yes, we do. We work on the Oh, so, so oh, oh my God, so much better. Okay.